Welcome to our last lecture on late modern and contemporary art. So we will first start with abstract expressionism. This is the first major American avant-garde movement which emerged in New York City in the 1940s. Now these artists produced abstract paintings that expressed their state of mind and that they hoped would strike emotional chords in viewers. So they sought to create a sort of universal experience. So abstract expressionism really evolved in the 1940s and 50s. So this is a visualization of the boldness of what artists are trying to do by transplanting the center of the avant-garde from Paris to New York by creating new tactics for paintings. This is particularly at a time of post-World War II where American artists were trying to create a name for themselves. The movement developed along two aesthetic lines, one, gestural abstraction, and the other, chromatic abstraction. So we'll talk about both of those and the artists associated with them in the upcoming slides. Jackson Pollock is an American artist. He is known for gestural abstraction. So this is the notion of the artist's gesture, or the literal act of making the artwork as being central to the finished product. His technique is known as action painting, and it elevated the importance of the process of making art. He used sticks as well as brushes to drip and pour the paint onto the canvas. In 1949, he was featured on Life magazine with the caption, is he the greatest living painter in the US? So this painting, titled number one, made in 1949, is an enormous scale being 63 by 102 inches. So this is a radical change in what painting is or could be. So note the lines which create rhythms and cross rhythms. There is this kind of overall effect. There's no clear focal point or center. All parts are kind of vying for our attention equally. This painting was made during his breakthrough period at the end of the 1940s into the beginning of the 1950s. Earlier methods had included dripping and splattering paint on canvas propped up on an easel. Here, Pollock lays the canvas on the floor. It is dripped, poured, flung paint from loaded paint sticks moving around and on the canvas. So this was a way for Pollock to really be in his work, not just intellectually, but physically. The topic that most interested these artists was the energy of a person, their values, their principles, the literal presence of a person. It's not hard to consider the body of the artist when looking at his paintings. The movements of the artist really complete the work. Our eye is restless, it's constantly moving to take in the picture, where one light starts or stops, what layers are on top or bottom, what kinds of paints are being used, if objects of the world are brought in. <clears throat> There's often evidence in addition to the paint and also some unique aspects of Pollock's painting is that you'll often see his cigarette ash as well as cigarette butts and other kind of worldly objects that had been fused to his painting during the process of making it. Pollock's process was initially dubbed action painting. So in this way, the artist is a performer who's engaged in a spontaneous set of actions. The results were a surprise to both the artist and its viewers. At a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act, rather than as a space in which to reproduce, redesign, analyze, or express an object, actual or imagined. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. So in this essay, 
popular scholar Rosenberg at this time understands that Pollock's way of working is different. Pollock is not responding, analyzing, or expressing his feelings about objects. Instead, there's a focus on the arena. What he means by this is that the canvas becomes a place where a fight happens to express the artist's individuality to the world. Think of an arena as the Colosseum, for example, when we looked at ancient Rome. This is an event, not a reproduction of another object, meaning that what is important is the process, not necessarily the product. So this is one where the artist is willing to take those risks. Rosenberg goes on to say, the American vanguard painter took to the white expanse of the canvas as Melville's Ishmael took to the sea. On the one hand, a desperate recognition of moral and intellectual exhaustion. On the other, the exhilaration of an adventure over depths in which he might find reflection or reflected the true image of his identity. So in the second part, Rosenberg is comparing Pollock and other painters he considered avant-garde to the character Ishmael in Moby Dick, in that this is a quest for the unknown. It is a challenge, a search for meaning, whose end result is unknown. This is because, in art, previous styles are exhausted. Artists should instead search for their own original identity, which relates more to the modern or contemporary practice of art. This echoes the feelings of abstract, or excuse me, abstract expressionist painters like Pollock. The topic that most interested these artists was the energy of a person, again, their values, principles, and their presence. Mark Rothko was a Russian-born American artist. This particular painting coincides with the 1950s, 1970s style where we have luminous rectangles floating in fields of color. color. Rothko was largely self-taught artist who experimented with many kinds of painting, including representational, social realist, surrealist, and abstract. And he even once worked as a theatrical set painter. He is known for his color field painting, which has large areas of color with no obvious focus of attention. Rothko simplified forms as much as possible, creating rectangles that seem to float in a field of color. This is the second classification of abstract painting known as chromatic abstraction, or also sometimes color field painting. We are meant to immerse ourselves in color and closely contemplate the effects of color. Our eye is meant to wander all over the whole canvas, to immerse ourselves within the fields of color. The physical sense of the viewer is very important for Rothko, and he wanted people to view it up close, to really essentially be in the space of the painting rather than apart from it. Pop art, beginning in the late 1950s, is a term coined by British art critic Lawrence Alloway, to refer to art that incorporated elements from consumer culture, the mass media, and popular culture, such as images for motion pictures and advertising. Many of the important artists we will see here, uh, one of which you may be familiar with is Andy Warhol. So we see the representational image actually reemerge, and it is with striking reality and banality. So. Pop art embraced recognizable subject matter and borrowed imagery from popular culture. Famous artworks and comic books, commercial advertising and car design, even to television and movies. Pop artists really bridged the, di the division between fine art and popular culture. Andy Warhol was a professional illustrator and graphic designer. He was one of the most famous pop artists, 
His first paintings were of comic book heroes, and he borrowed a significant amount of imagery from advertising, as seen here in his famous Campbell soup cans. Pop artists adopted commercial methods like silk screening or produced multiples of works, downplaying the artist's hand and subverting the idea of originality. So this is in marked contrast to the highly expressive, large-scale abstract works of the abstract expressionist who, whose work had dominated post-war American art. Pop artists favored realism, everyday and even mundane imagery, and heavy doses of irony and wit. When Warhol first exhibited Campbell's suit cans in 1962, each of the 32 canvases rested on a shelf mounted on the wall, essentially like groceries in a store. The number of paintings corresponds to the variety of soup then sold by the Campbell Soup Company. Warhol assigned a different soup variety to each, checking them off on a product list supplied by Campbell once their quote-unquote portraits were completed. It's important to understand the contrast between pop art and abstract expressionism, which had just become or had just come before in America. By embracing the stark naturalism and mass media imagery despised by the abstract expressionist artists, pop artists were also engaging in an explicit critique. It's a critique that makes abstract expressionism, with its claims as being high art as being pretentious. And the images of our everyday life, that was more true. That is what the pop artists wanted to represent. To the pop artists working at the same time as the height of abstract expressionism in the 50s and into the 60s, this is making their work stand apart. To them, the legacy of abstract expressionism was oppressive. They weren't concerned with the heroic act of painting or the process, they were concerned with the idea of solidarity, tortured genius working alone in their studio to create masterpieces, moving into the unknown. Minimalism is defined as a predominantly sculptural American trend of the 1960s that developed as a reaction against previous modern art characterized by works featuring a severe reduction of form, often to single homogeneous units. So in the 1960s, there is a reaction against abstract expressionism and pop art characteristics. So this ushers in a new era of art that is non-representational, has neutral textures and flat colors, geometric shapes, mechanical construction, it strips away emotion and meaning. Many artists that we'll see include Jude, or Donald Jude, and Dan Flavin, as well as Robert Morris. Morris worked in a way contrary to the understanding of modern art up to this point in 1965. Most notably, that the meaning of a work of art was self-contained. All experience of that object is present in the work, internally, regardless of the time, place, or viewer. For Morris, art was something that extends out from the object and into it, its environment. He wanted us to be aware of the conditions and experience of art. First, there are conditions that always affect the way we comprehend an art object. Our experience is bound to someone, someplace, at some time. What we see, three sculptures in the shape of an L, placed in the room in varying positions. They are the same exact shape, but our experience of them shifts based on their position, which makes them seem distinct, and also our position, which changes our perception of these objects as we move in the space. Thus, and more importantly, art is a culmination of the self-contained object, their environment, and our bodily relationship to them. The idea of the body as being important for the viewing of art was opposite of the idea of modernist art. 
which was informed by theories of perception and the body. Our next work comes from Donald Judd. Although it is hung on the wall like a painting, it is titled Untitled, or Stack, and projects nearly three free feet from the wall and climbs like rungs on a ladder from the floor to the ceiling. It is made of galvanized iron boxes, all identical and of equal importance. The space around the boxes is also important. The sides are covered with commercially available green lacquer paint, typically used to customize Harley-Davidson motorcycles. The tops and bottoms are bare metal. Each of the 12 boxes is 9 inches high, and they are spaced 9 inches apart. The box was one of Judge, Judd's favorite forms because he felt it was neutral and had no symbolic meaning. Judd also ignored traditional craft skills in favor of an overriding system or idea. He wanted his work to suggest an industrial production line. In fact, Judd had his works made in a factory in order to obtain a perfect finish without having to rework the material. They were then installed in the gallery or museum to his specifications. So doing this, ordering the product from a factory, having it installed given constructions, downplays the traditional identification of what is fine art. So the role of the artist as creator is thus limited in favor of mechanized production and assembly. Next we come to conceptual art, which was an American avant-garde movement of the 1960s whose premise was that of artfulness of art that lay in the artist's idea rather than its final expression. So it was more about the concept of art rather than the finished product. The key artists that we'll be looking at are Joseph Kosuth, Bruce Nauman, and Anna Mentieta. Joseph Kosuth was an American conceptual artist inspired by Duchamp's ready-mades, as seen in chapter 2.7. It was an interest in art that appealed to the mind rather than the senses. What we're looking at here is the artwork titled One and Three Chairs. It presents three things a chair could be. A photograph of a chair, an actual chair, and the dictionary definition of the word chair. So this raises questions about knowledge, language, and understanding. Many conceptual artists used language in place of brush and canvas, and words played a primary role in their emphasis on ideas over visual forms. Baldessari grew up looking at quote-unquote serious works of high modernism, and he begins to consider how art can be something other than painting. And he's doing this as a sort of irony and humor. How many times can you see the artist calling another art boring? What makes new art not boring? And this is reflected in the title of Balasari's artwork titled, I Will Not Make Any More Boring Art. This is a response to Nova Scotia College of Art and Design requesting him to do an exhibition there in 1971. There wasn't enough money to have him brought there himself, so the artist proposed that the students voluntarily write I will not make any more boring art on the walls of the gallery. Almost like punishment. Old school writing on the chalkboard, the thing was something that you did wrong. He had apparently written this in his no own notebook originally, and he said, to my surprise, they covered the walls. We all agree that the word art signifies art, but everyone has a different interpretation of what the word art means. While one person may consider a work of art boring, another may find it brilliant, and still another might not consider it art at all. So the question arises of, is it a work of art? What separates this from Baldessori's artwork? It's mainly the system in which it is understood, and this is centrally important. 
So the context, if it is seen in a gallery, what if I wrote this in a gallery wall? Would it be accepted as artists or as an artwork? The artist as well. It's art because the artist says so. And the idea, the reaction it provokes, especially in the broader arena of art critics, etc. Postmodern art is a reaction against modernist formalism seen as elitist. This art often includes irony and reveals a self-conscious awareness on the part of the artist and art making process or the workings of the art world. Most broadly, postmodernism defines the art after modernism and is different from it. The characteristics are an extreme self-reflection and awareness. What is at stake in postmodernism is the nature of truth itself questions the validity of grand narratives by recognizing that truth is contingent rather than universal. For example, that high art of modernism left little room for artists of other gender, sexuality, culture, or ethnicity to participate in. Uh, for example, when you have artists or artistic movements like abstract expressionism, which were dominated by white male artists, you have an exclusion of other genders, sexualities, cultures, and eth ethnicities. In postmodern art, this idea is expressed through several key aspects. First, you have irony and parody the use of low culture in a high culture context to question what art is. Second, you have an appropriation of the past using an already existing object or image in a new context to create a new meaning. Third, you have juxtaposition using incongruent styles together, for example, like abstract and figurative. Fourthly, you have pluralism, expressing multiple viewpoints, um, whether that be political, openness to difference, meaning sex, race, gender, etc. You also have, fifthly, deconstruction, looking at the multiple meanings in an image or text to find a sort of bias. So bias is a preconception towards one opinion or another. Architecture in the postmodernist period resists the unifying aesthetic and corresponding faith in a single vision of architectural or urban design. Unlike modernist architecture, but it could include some elements of it, just not all, so it kind of re resists the total grand vision. Instead, it often includes an illogical and eclectic mix of history and historical imagery. It uses decoration and ornamentation and includes metaphor, symbolism, and playfulness. In Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia, as seen here, we can see an American architect who was the Dean of Yale School of Architecture. This particular type of arch architecture is impersonal and sterile. In the post-war world, there was a sense of commercial or industrial sameness. So this led to a loss of place in many American cities and neighborhoods. That you are no longer unique, that you are a sort of cookie-cutter piece of society. This was influenced by the philosopher Venturi's ideas where modernist architecture was unsuited to human social activity of cities. Postmodern architects also embrace the messy and chaotic nature of city life. Eclecticism and dialogue between traditional and contemporary elements. So in this Piazza d'Italia, we have an open plaza dedicated to the city's Italian-American history. There's elements of Italian history all the way back to Rome with the Corinthian columns. And 
Moore wanted it to be an architectural focus of ethnic identity, but also a space that was vibrant, so perhaps the setting of an annual festival, and one that would integrate with and complement the street activity. So this incorporates the specifics of the site itself, the literal geographic location. So it needed to be accessible to pedestrians along three axes. So one solution is bold lines of the skyscraper, which are echoed in the concentric rings of the piazza. So if you look at the skyscrapers, you can see the difference in the panels of the light sandstone color against the black glass color, which is echoed in the tile used for the actual ground of the piazza. We have also discussed the idea of the Roman Forum, which was also used for basilicas in later Christian art, but the Forum itself was a economic, political, and civic hub. So there's the idea of this kind of free mixing of the different orders from the Greeks. We're also adding to this historical elements that are challenged by modern building materials. We can see that there are stainless steel capitals for the columns, various neon highlights along the cornices and friezes, and a conglomeration of symbolic, historical, commercial, and geographic illusions. So this is taking a classical ideal of architecture and revitalizing it in a contemporary urban era. So it is something that becomes unmistakable for anywhere else in the world. Our next style of contemporary art concerns feminism. Feminist art can be a way of categorizing art made by mostly women that consciously link its strategies and goals to those of the women's rights movement of the late 1960s and 70s and to feminist ideas and pol politics ever since. So these female artists are challenging the art world and its specifically white male institutional biases. Feminist analysis serves as a critical lens for gender, but also class, ethnicity, culture, religion, and sexuality. In this image, we can see Judy Chicago's dinner party made in 1979. Chicago continued the feminist ideas she explored in the arts program during the 1970s, considering how artists should investigate the social dynamics of power and privilege in America, especially in relation to gender. Judy Chicago wanted to educate the public about women's role in history as well as the fine arts and establish a greater respect for that role. So here she uses craft techniques traditionally practiced by women, including needlepoint and pottery, the artwork itself is titled Dinner Party, which alludes to the role of women as homemakers. So it started with the idea of a feminist sort of last supper with 13 honored guests who would be women instead of men, referencing back to the last supper of Leonardo da Vinci as we saw with the artwork of Leonardo da Vinci, we discussed the pyramidal or triangular composition. In this instance, Chicago is using the triangle to refer to ancient symbols for a woman or a goddess. So there's a sense of the celebration of achievements of these women throughout history. The floor itself in the center of the triangle is inscribed with 999 additional names as a foundation for these other women. Many of these specific place settings in Chicago's artwork include many significant female figures throughout history. In these two details, you can see the names of Virginia Woolf and Emily Dickinson, 
both very prominent writers. They are represented by a specific tablecloth as well as a place setting arrangement which kind of represents the female form but found in nature. This new attention to women's rights would also spawn feminist activism in the 1970s, which led the way for later institutional critique. The Guerrilla Girls were a group of anonymous feminists that began in 1985. They called themselves the conscious of the art world. The term itself, guerrilla, literally meaning guerrilla, but also guerrilla tactics, as in warfare, were used as a reference to their unorthodox tactics for raising awareness about key issues facing the art world. They used humor, irony, and bold imagery for serious matters, such as institutional critique. So many ask the question of why were they anonymous? Why wear the mask? At this point in the 1980s, many of these women were current artists, so the boldness of their message may have actually subverted their artistic career. They would often refer to themselves by the names of historical female artists, so their messages are direct and well-researched, exposing the underlying oppression still present in the many art market systems and institutions. Here we can see one of their advertisements. I'll give you guys uh, about 30 seconds to read through this. So this conveys sort of like their manifesto as the advantages of being a woman artist. So this is really stating to the female artists that as a guerrilla girl, you are essentially free from the expectations of the male-dominated art world, which was very significant for this artistic movement of the time. So for next time, we will be meeting in class again, so remember that on April 30th, which is a Monday, we will be returning to the classroom for our final exam review. The final exam review is again available for you guys on Blackboard as well as the images. We will be doing a quiz as we did last time for extra points on the exam, so go ahead and study the quiz. Make sure you know all of the answers. Additionally, make sure to bring at least one single space page of notes on each lecture, so there should be six pages total for your journal, as well as two discussion questions which have already been sent to you via Blackboard announcement each Friday.